Hey everybody, welcome back to Parkitect. Live from my self-quarantine at my own place, but from my laptop for a change, because I actually recorded this entire episode while I was traveling, uh, actually in Austria a while back, and I decided to keep this back on my computer in case I didn't have something to upload for a week, which is this week, which is also supposed to be the week that I am... Um, well, I was going to be in Paris, but I decided to cancel those trips a few days ago because of the coronavirus, which turned out to be a good decision because at this point Disneyland Paris is closed, the catacombs are closed. It's just a bad idea to go around traveling. So instead, I'm back home making videos, so that's kind of also a good thing. Anyway, let's just get started and not talk about that for too much because I'm sure you guys are hearing about it more than enough already. Um, and let's get to Silica Slopes, which is the scenario for today. Now, as you might notice, I have a continue button right here because I actually already started recording this, but let's actually just act as if I haven't. This is a uh, scenario where you have a small plot of land in a desolate forested valley, and you have to use the little space you have at your disposal to build a charming amusement park. You can buy more land, um, <laughs> you can buy more land to expand the park, but you cannot get loans. Now we need to get 450 guests in the park and have an overall park rating of 85%. So, the goals aren't too steep, I'll be very honest, and, oh, that's a spoiler. The goals aren't too steep, but when it comes to this scenario, the main challenge is really the terrain. So, for one, it is quite a hilly scenario, as you can see, but it's also quite small. The amount of available space is really limited, and you can buy more land. So, if I start visualizing that, there is a fair bit of land that you can buy, but it's still going to be the main challenge for this scenario, I would say. Now, this one was inspired actually by my favorite scenario in the original Roller Coaster Tycoon, which is called Mothball Mountain. I believe that's the UK or US version name, and it, there is a different name for it as well, but I don't know that name. Uh, I just know that on my RCT it was always called Mothball Mountain, um, which is a really cool scenario with some difficult terrain and very limited uh, size map. And I always enjoyed that one a lot, just trying to figure out how to puzzle the pieces of the park together in such a way that it doesn't look overly cramped, but you can still get everything you need into the small plot of land. And yeah, the challenge is pretty much going to be very similar to that in this scenario. Now the rides that we get at the start are kind of limited as well. We do get a lot of stalls, so that's nice. But we only have a carousel, a ferris wheel, a swinging ship, and some very basic coasters to start off with. So, with that all said, let's jump into it and see what I made out of this thing. Alright, so starting off, I need to have a money maker, because if I want this park to actually succeed, and if I want to actually learn from my last epic failure in Sakura Gardens, I really need to start off with something that makes sense from a gameplay perspective. Now unfortunately, as I had to learn the hard way in the last video, you really can't cheese your way out of a situation like this in this game, and shuttle loops just don't really work. Which is unfortunate, in a sense, but I'm also really happy about it because it means that, you know, you're really forced to come up with some more realistic ways to make the park run a profit. So in this case, I figured probably the best way to get started with a steel coaster that fits into this difficult terrain is not too expensive, but at the same time has good enough stats to earn some money, is to just build a small launched coaster. Now, my inspiration here specifically is from Joker's Jinx or any of the premier LIM launch coasters which are typically referred to as spaghetti ball coasters. Now, if you look up pictures of uh, Joker's Jinx in uh, Six Flags America, actually, I'm just gonna leave a picture here. Um, you can see that it just, it's just a giant bunch of tangled track. It starts out simple enough with a cobra roll, but after that it just evolves into a series of helixes and corkscrews all intertwined. So that's kind of where the name uh, Spaghetti Ball comes from. I'm actually not sure how de facto or official the name Spaghetti Ball Coaster is. I feel like it was not Premier themselves who coined that term, but the term is just so accepted within coaster enthusiast groups that I'm really not sure if it's like official or not. But that's what we all call those things, and that's what they look like, and that's... Now we basically all know those things. I've never actually been on one myself, but I have to say 
I have been on Express Platform 13 in Walibi Holland, which, all things considered, is kind of a spaghetti ball coaster by Vekoma, although both coasters are actually like this for a similar reason, um, because for both coasters there also exist dark ride versions of Sp uh, Joker's Jinx. I forgot what the dark ride version is called, uh, but for Express it's just Rock and Roller Coaster in Disneyland Paris, so they're their ridiculously compact layouts are really just a result of the layouts being designed for indoor use. Somebody just decided to put them outside as well. But uh, yeah, those things are pretty cool and a nice way to get a short layout with a good bang for our buck, if you will, that still delivers some good excitement rating so that I can start charging some ridiculous sums of money, but at the same time doesn't you know use too much space or too much of my budget. So it's all Gucci. Now, this station is kind of boring. I have to admit that it's only later in this video that I start to experiment a bit more with the architecture in this park because I've had so many alpine scenarios at this point that I'm almost starting to get in that stage where everything is just kind of the same and I start relying on the same techniques and pieces and color schemes, which is always a bit of a shame, so I'm definitely going to try to experiment a bit more with the pieces later on in this video, but this station, at first, you know, just getting into it, is still a bit more simple. It's just a simple gabled roof going over the station track itself, with then 90 degrees rotated from that a gable sort of toward the entrance, kind of drawing people into the building, with at the, the middle section between that. A nice spire, of course, because I can't go without a spire, although I do like the way that the roof of the front of the station kind of continues down to this lower level where the entrance of the queue line is, which I think just also kind of makes sense as a queue line. I'm always trying to pay attention to the fact that the queue lines in this game of course won't be realistic in a sense that real life queues are much longer and have lots of switchbacks and things like this, but I do want to follow some of the realism guidelines and King RCT3 especially uh, put me on blast on this on uh, one of the earliest Parkitect videos comment sections that my cues tended to be quite hidden in the past or not really have logical layouts or positions so now I'm really trying to make sure that they kind of flow through the landscape in a sense that as a real life queue line would do even if on a much smaller scale uh, and that their entrance is actually very well recognizable and a clear demarcation of where you can enter the ride, which I feel like with this coaster, it's uh, it's fairly the case. Now, moving on from this, it's time to get to the entrance area of the park, because I do want to open this park up and make sure that people can get to the coaster and um, yeah, hopefully start earning some money, because that's really my main priority at this point. Uh, but there will also be a very small Main Street section down here. And I really have to emphasize that it's going to be really small, but I thought if I'm going to put a bunch of buildings anywhere in this park and have some food courts, toilets and things like that, it's not just realistically at the entrance, but also the entrance is one of the best spaces to do this. I think it makes sense to have a little alpine village down here in the valley close to the lake that's just in real life where you would find these kinds of villages in the mountains as well, so I think it works out from a thematic standpoint as well. Um, so yeah, that's just what this area is going to be. And then of course, a uh, waterside carousel too, because those things are just always nice. And for me at least, this thing along with uh, the chair swing are two of the flat rides that always work best when you put them on a waterfront. So yeah, here I'm starting with the entrance area with the, uh, the the food market, I guess, and toilet building at first. And I'm really glad that at least despite all of the challenges in this scenario, there is a good selection of stalls because if that wasn't available, I honestly wouldn't know how much more time it would have taken me to get this scenario to a decent position. But um, I think with all this, it's much easier to get started. So. Once again, I think the biggest struggle in this map is trying to get the buildings to look off-grid a little bit and having those overhanging roofs that you see in alpine uh, landscapes in Europe and actually adding some detail to the roofs as well. I do want to go a little bit into the Swiss chalet style architecture. So for this building, I just decided to have the roofs stick over uh, 
the actual walls by a full tile, which is quite a lot, but I think given the balconies underneath it, the, the sort of walkways that are um, one meter or, well, one block above the pathways, given that those are there, I think it works out quite all right. Um, so then I also added some detail to the gables here, some decoration to give it that sort of Swiss chalet style um, vibes. And finally, which is something that I don't think I've tried in Park Tech before, but it's fairly doable, uh, a bunch of stones on the roof to hold down the roof. What you'll often find in all kinds of alpine landscapes, not just in Europe, but really all over the world. And this is just a very old traditional way of creating roofs is putting lots of big rocks on a roof to hold down the, the wooden pieces, whichever kind of pieces the roof is made out of. So in this case, there aren't any, you know, really small rocks in Parkitect. So I'm mostly just using bigger rocks that are sunken into the roof. But I think it creates the same kind of texture as these, these rock covered roofs that you can find in real life, where the weight of the rocks is used to keep the roof in place. Um, and it's really interesting how this is one of these kind of architectural themes that you find throughout the world. I remember um, a while ago I was looking into Alpine architecture because Alpine is a strange term because technically it refers to the Alps in Europe, but then it's also just generally used to talk about anything mountainous. So there's kind of a strict and a loose definition to the word there. But when it comes to Alpine architecture worldwide, it tends to be very similar. It tends to really have these large overhanging roofs uh, be built very much out of uh, wood made from evergreen trees and use techniques such as these rocks uh, holding down the weight of the roof. Um, so it's really interesting how you can find very similar looking buildings all across the world. I've seen some buildings in Nepal, for instance, that don't even look too different from traditional European Alpine buildings. Um, and it's cool because, in a sense, architecture is always a result of its natural context. And this is even true for the most modern architecture. One of the interesting sort of local things about brutalism, whether you're a fan of brutalism or not, is the fact that many times, especially in older brutalist buildings, the, the texture of their concrete will really reflect the local materials as well. Um, so even there you can find some you know local effects the, the 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 colors of brickwork is always dependent on whatever kind of clay is in the country uh, but yeah i'm getting very very off topic at this point i decided to uh, finish the main street with just one final small building which really just serves as a seating area for the food courts because the building with uh, the stalls and the toilet in it itself didn't have anything like that, so I decided to just add it separately like that. Now moving on, here's the second coaster, and it's going to be quite a bit more interesting than the first one. It's even going to feature two lift hills, uh, be quite long, and a bunch of different unique elements. And, well, it's a Gerstlauer, so, you know... What do you what do you know? That's usually what they tend to do. Or at least, if there's any manufacturer that likes to pull out the, the cheesy tricks and long layouts with different launches and lift hills, it's probably Gerstlauer. Um, I was a fair bit inspired by Takabisha, for instance, for this ride. Although, of course, given the terrain and the limitations of the, um, the size of the map, it's going to look quite different. But Takabisha was kind of my starting point. I wanted to have some kind of Eurofighter that really felt like it had two stages to the layout. Um, and I at least tried to get to that point as much as I could with this one. Although actually, I have to say, spoiler alert, I did try to have a lift hill on this thing for a while. Uh, but I think I gave up on that idea in the end. I'm actually not sure, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but it's still kind of divided into two sections. You'll see in a minute. Um, it's starting off simple enough with just a beyond vertical drop into a loop into an overbanked turn. At this point, it is actually still the standard Eurofighter layout that tends to be cloned around quite a bit. Uh, I forgot which one this is uh, specifically, like what the name was, uh, but it is definitely the start of a standard Eurofighter layout. Um, and then it also just features a bunch of other twists and turns and a barrel roll and then a helix at the end and then that's the end of the layout 
It's quite small, it's quite simple, but really for a coaster of that budget, I think it delivers a lot of thrills. Um, but yeah, for this one, obviously, I wanted to do a bit more. So after some meandering around in this back section of the park, we finally return to the top of the hill here, uh, where we have a small break run section that I'm still trying to figure out exactly at which height I want to put it down. Uh, it's definitely taking a little bit of elbow sweat to get it to the right place. Um, and yeah, for this, at this point, I was also considering having a lift hill here, but I think in hindsight, realistically, it's a little bit unnecessary. It doesn't really need the extra momentum because it's still uh, quite a ways off above the station. And also a lift hill like this just isn't really realistic. In real life, you would never see a coaster just go up and just hook up straight onto a chain just like that. You really need a small brake run before the lift hill. And I really didn't have enough space to you know, add a brake run and another separate lift hill. So I just ended up doing it like this. Now, of course, the idea is that I do want to have some path interaction. So later on, I'm definitely going to have some scenery and path work around that drop and turn it into a spectacle to uh, see as well for the people who aren't on the coaster, but do want to see people go around on it. I'm really still kind of missing the uh, the B&M dive coaster in this game because this is technically the vertical coaster in this game since it is sort of the vertical drop coaster. But then in Roller Coaster Tycoon, of course, the vertical coaster was the B&M dive machine. So both games are kind of correct in their names, but I'm still kind of missing the dive machine in the vanilla game. Of course, it's something that you can easily mod into it, but um, it's just something that works out really well if you need a short coaster that you really want to put on display. And that just tends to be something that would work amazing in scenario mode. I mean, for one, the vertical drop coaster in Roller Coaster Tycoon is also one of the, if not the best coaster as far as money making is concerned, because it's crazy efficient and has a throughput that's just through the roof and you can usually get very high excitement ratings with just very short layouts. But yeah, moving on from that game uh, and actually going back to Parkitect, I decided to have this whole plateau up here uh, with some rides and other stuff just to, you know, also have some points of interest to actually visit the top of the hill for. Maybe it could be the leftovers of old ruins of some kind of old castle or whatever but I decided to add a sort of brick facade made out of the fences as well as stucco walls and whichever small pieces I could find to make small bricks, which is uh, the Studio KV technique from the days of old, which just always comes in clutch. And finally also, and this was my idea for the entire time, I just wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to put it off without a lift hill, but finally, I wanted to turn this section of the drop coaster into a sort of mineshaft, very Baron 1898-esque. And the original idea was indeed to make this a lift hill, so then it would, you know, be a bit more thematic because you could really come to a, come to a halt and then start going up that lift hill like the, the mine tower, as you would see it in Baron 1898. But I think this is still a fair compromise. It looks pretty cool and it makes for a cool scene as you drop into the hall. Uh, I even <laughs> built this little stadium thing where people can walk around and watch the coaster drop down into the tunnel. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, a pretty cool thing to still add something of interest at the end of the layout. Something that Personally, I really like about coasters like Takabisha is the fact that their entire layout just remains really interesting because too many coasters, of course, suffer from the fact that you lose energy as you go through the ride. Like the, the final parts of a roller coaster layout are typically the slowest parts where the forces aren't as intense anymore. Uh, and the first drop is very often the best thing. Uh, and with a coaster like Takabisha, that's just not really the case because you start out with an amazing indoor section that 
Actually, I'm not going to spoil for anyone who might be going to Fuji-Q Highland in the near future and doesn't know what happens indoors in Takabisha. It's just a fun surprise that I don't want to spoil. But after that, you go into a launch section, which is absolutely amazing. You have the first half of the layout. Uh, and after that, you climb up the lift hill. You finally do that ridiculous beyond vertical drop, which used to be the steepest drop in the world. Still pretty much is even though it's shared now with the record uh, of the coaster in the, the Mall of America, I think. Whatever, the, the TMT, uh, um, no, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shell Razor in uh, some mall in New Jersey. I, I always forget the name of the mall because it's, it's such a terrible place. It looks really boring, but that coaster is basically Takabisha, except a one degree steeper drop, which I don't think anybody's ever gonna realize. But uh, that coaster technically took the record from Takabisha, but I kind of feel like both coasters sort of share the record in spirit because it's just the same exact layout. They just made the drop a tiny bit steeper to steal the record. That's just vanity records. Um, anyway, I'm getting <laughs> super off topic. I just like that layout because the uh, signature element is somewhere in the middle of the layout and after that you still have a bunch of really cool elements and as you slam into the brakes at the end of the ride you don't have a single second of downtime or a single part of the layout that just feels like you're making your way to the station and i just love that i think the same goes for the Fluch von Novgorod in Hansa Park which is another Gerstlauer which honestly really surprised me it is a coaster with one of the most intense launches in Europe, which is just crazy. It's just this Eurofighter that randomly has a super intense launch. Uh, and after that launch, you just do a bunch of cool elements. You come back into a building and then you have another vertical um, lift hill and vertical drop, kind of like Takabisha, just on a much smaller scale and with more theming. Uh, so these are both just two really cool rides that in sort of Gerstlauer fashion, do a lot with what they're given and just have these multiple parts of the layout without really having much downtime, if you will. And that's just what I wanted to do with this coaster, all right? Sorry, that needed this whole story because I just wanted to gush about Takabisha and Flug von Novgorod. Going back to the program though, um, I wasn't really too happy with the mineshafts that I built earlier. So this tower here is a bit more fancy, a bit more mine-ish looking, a bit more proper. Um, and of course, this is the vertical drop at the start of the coaster. So in a sense, it is also the weenie of the ride. And the thing that makes the ride as a whole entity kind of stand out and just give it some sort of character. It's also connected to the station, which I'm working on right now. So altogether, I think it'll be a structure that works quite well. But then all of this is just very, you know, ripped off from Baron 1898. It's just a concept that is way too cool. Baron 1898 is, I think, one of those coasters that you could notice within coaster games like Parktech and Planet Coaster just inspired a lot of people. Uh, because still to this day, I see many people, you know, building something similar, taking inspiration from Baron 1898 and giving it their own spin. Uh, and it's just every now and then these coasters are built, which have this effect of uh, inspiring a lot of people to do something similar. Uh, I think Gatekeeper did this very thing in Rollercoaster Tycoon 3. I remember a lot of Gatekeeper-like roller coasters coming out around the time. Um, and Baron 1898 just has this effect on mineshaft coasters with a lift hill connected to the station with a, a drop straight after it. It's just a really cool scenery concept and one of the things that really pulls that coaster together and makes it so iconic even though the layout is kind of lame and kind of forceless, let's be honest. Nobody really likes the layout of Baron 1980, uh, 19, 1898. God, how do I keep forgetting the the actual year that the coaster is based on. So finally, and this is actually going to be the, the final coaster of this scenario, I wanted to build a floorless coaster. I'm not sure if I really wanted to build a floorless coaster or if this was just the coaster that I ended up getting in research and decided to just stick with it, but it doesn't really matter. I decided to build a floorless coaster and I figured that despite the fact that I already have two pretty intense coasters that are quite worthy of being 
uh, signature coasters for the park. I really wanted that one signature ride, which, you know, in in universe could be the signature coaster of the park and the main attraction, um, but also could be my thumbnail for today because I was kind of like, I'm, I'm gonna need a good thumbnail if I want to appease the the YouTube algorithmic gods, which is. Uh, such nonsense because this is just Parkitect which has a very unique viewership anyway so it's not like clickbait's techniques are really going to work too well but I just like it I just wanted to build something which would be the the iconic sort of structure for the park and I didn't feel like I really had that with the coasters so far it's also a really good opportunity to make more use of the terrain uh, because even though the Eurofighter and the LIM launch coaster made some limited use of the terrain, I really felt like I could do a bit more with it. So this flawless coaster is really hugging it as much as possible with that station on top of the hill and the lift hill alongside another hill. Uh, it just kind of makes it its way down doing a bunch of inversions and then comes back with very little speed left into brake run. So it's a very efficient coaster uh, that nonetheless I feel doesn't really meander too much at the end so I'm actually quite happy with the layout. The only struggle was trying to get these paths to the station building because that station building is up very high so that's a bit annoying but it was all part of the plan I have to say because I just had this idea for a castle like station building that I really wanted to try and it's going to be an it's going to be a bit annoying because the coaster track is going above the station there as well, but that's also just part of the plan. You'll see in a second. Uh, this was very much inspired by the station of Lech Coaster in uh, Legendia, which, as you might know, is one of my co my favorite coasters in the world. Just a really cool new generation of Vekoma. I'm sure that it's gonna, you know, be blown out of the water by the new new generation of Vekomas that are being built right now in China and in Energylandia and other places. But for now, Lech Coaster is just the best Vekoma I've ever been on, and it has a really cool element, which is a corkscrew. Oh, it's kind of a corkscrew, but a little bit like um, just a zero-g roll as well, except it doesn't really hit zero-g's uh, because the corkscrew doesn't really have that much of a curve to it. Uh, but yeah, it has a roll going through the station, and then the station building is also just really built around this roll as well, uh, which I think is the really cool thing. Sometimes you see stations with elements going through it, um, but then they just make the station look like it's partly broken or there's just a hole in the building or something. But with Lech Coaster, you can clearly see um, the station building has been built with the coaster layout in mind and or vice versa. So you can really see the roof curving around the element, which is really cool. It's not the most beautiful station ever. Uh, you can tell that the materials are quite cheap. But it's just a really cool concept and the way that it's laid into the park and the way that the coaster and the scenery intermingle, it's just, it's just really cool. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna spend like half this episode just gushing about coasters that I've been on. What else am I gonna do? Um, but yeah, this, uh, this castle kind of tries to do a similar thing, although it will be a bit different because I couldn't really find a, a good way to curve around this, uh, this inversion. Uh, while making it look decent. So instead I have a bunch of roof structures on this castle and I'm going to connect them with support beams that the coaster inversion is also connected to. And of course I'm also adding a spire because every iconic building needs its one iconic element. So especially for this sort of gothic revival kind of ar uh, architecture castle where you can tell that it's a castle but it's it's not really a real castle it's not a real defensive castle it's more like one of those 18th or 19th century castles that rich kings built because they were into fairy tales and they figured they could build whatever it's that kind of castle um then of course i want to make it a bit fancy add some detail to it some timber frames and a fancy spire because that's just kind of how it goes with these sorts of buildings. Something that I actually kind of like in this, this final build of the castle is that brake run which curves around the spire at the bottom there. 
For some reason, it's not really something I thought about when I created the layout of the coaster, but it just works out perfectly to kind of frame the tower and add this lower section to the castle, which helps, you know, blend the castle into the rest of this hilly environment. So I'm actually really happy with how that turned out. And as a sort of visual counterweight to the big spire, I'm adding a smaller spire here. One of the cool tricks that I found out throughout my time of playing Parkitect is that despite the fact that we don't really have any steep spire pieces, aside from the roof piece that I use on the uh, larger tower there, um, you can definitely stack a bunch of just normal shapes on top of each other and by mixing some cubes and pyramid pieces you can definitely create some steeper roofs and they'll always look a tiny bit funky um, but it's also funky in a good way. I think it adds some interesting detail and it's cooler than a roof where it's just a single flat texture. So yeah, one of the things that just make Spire such a, a fun thing to build for me are just that they're amazing opportunities to mix different pieces in the game together, see how they can work and how you can use them to create extra levels of detail. It's obviously something that you can do with walls as well, but with spires you can really just kind of stick everything into it and see whatever lands. And it's just a really cool way to experiment and just always come up with, you know, a new kind of design of spire. You can always try to evolve and they never just they, they just never have to look the same, which is really fun. Um, which also helps because I always need to try my best to uh, not make my buildings look the same as buildings of some of my earlier scenarios that I've played and actually try to evolve a little bit as a builder as well. So finally, for this section of the park, I'm adding a kind of cave entrance here for the coaster where I think you can clearly tell that this is where you need to go if you want to ride the coaster, but it kind of distances and separates the actual paths from the uh, castle of the station entrance, which is uh, kind of towering above everything in this map in general. And I don't really want to look into the guest view in Parkitect because personally I like to keep this isometric view intact because I love the sort of suspense of uh, disbelief or, or sort of the, the filling in the gaps style of, of Parkitect. So I'm not going to go into a first person view but I can imagine that if you were in a first person view and you'd be down there in that valley the the castle being perched on top of that hill just creates this wonderful sense of forced perspective where it looks like a giant castle especially with that spire brought to the front whereas in reality the building isn't really bigger than any of the other buildings in this map it just works out that way due to the natural terrain. Now at this point I figured I wasn't, you know, putting enough time into detailing my buildings and I really liked the trick of creating a roof covered in stones. So I decided to do the same thing on this building just for the hell of it. It doesn't really change too much about anything, but it just it just looks so cool. It's one of these tricks that I kind of want to use more often, but as you might notice, I had to create these horizontal stripes on the roof by putting a bunch of cubes together. So that's probably the most annoying part about doing all of this. It takes a lot of effort to get those horizontal wooden slats in. Uh, but once you do, and you can have the stone sort of resting on those, it does create a really cool, interesting looking roof. Anyway, that's it for this time lapse. Let's jump into the game and see how the park is doing. And just like that, I managed to finish the scenario. Also, and I hope this is not something that you didn't notice, but only now start to notice, I couldn't really filter my voice in the way that I usually want to, because for some reason, whenever I tried to noise gate in Audacity, which is what I normally use to cancel out my breath noises, um, it just didn't work, and it would mess up the stereo sound. So. You can hear me breathing in this whole video, and I find this really weird uh, now that I'm already editing the earlier sections of the video, but I really hope it's something you didn't notice before, and um, actually no, I hope it's something you kind of noticed before and you're not starting to notice now because then it'll be extra annoying. But anyway, no, I'm sorry about that if you did notice it. Anyway, let's actually move into the topic of looking at the park. 
My laptop is being extremely loud in the background. Please forgive him. Uh, this is uh, this is not really what it's made for. So let's just go on. Actually, I should probably do the coasters in chronological order. So this one, I think, it's the Silica Twister. It actually has a name, which is <laughs> kind of unusual for my playthroughs because I normally just like to play uh, without naming anything. Uh, but yeah, let's just straight skip into the POV. So as you can see, Oh my god, there's the X button. Uh, as you can see, it's a pretty simple layout, not too much to it. It's really kind of just like Joker's Jinx, except with less helixes. And then, of course, there's a break run hidden inside this building. Um, but also, quite relevant is the fact that I could technically hide a second train here. The only reason that I didn't do it is because it pretty much is at capacity still, but if the park were busier and if I couldn't fit this many people on a train, I could also run this thing with uh, two train ops, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would have to go out of my way to also add an extra break here, but it's possible. Anyway, moving on from that one, we have the Eurofighter here, and I'm gonna have to see if there's actually a car in the station that's gonna go anytime soon. Eh, I guess, yeah, there we go. Alright, so up the lift hill, which is pretty simple. I just used a bunch of beam pieces to create this vertical lift. And then you go through the support structure. <laughs> you get the two wheels at the top, which is very Baron 1898-esque. And drop down into the drop. And this, this first part is really similar to standard Eurofighter fare. Just a turnaround after the loop, bit of an S-curve. But then we start doing something else going into this dive loop here and another little airtime hill just a pop of airtime Takabisha likes to do that as well some twisty curves into the mid course brake run after which we kind of slam into this holding brake uh, it's not supposed to go into the holding brake quite that quickly but it's just kind of something that ended up happening due to the fact that cars with people in them go quite a bit faster than empty cars so the testing speed doesn't really account for the actual speed that this coaster uh, rides through the layout at. Um, something else that I forgot to note is the fact that I also used this little brick trick on some of the other buildings. And full credits to Studio KV for coming up with this idea. You can just see uh, a bunch of castle walls, but also small castle, uh, small cubes here, or also just. Um, cornice pieces acting as smaller bricks with a slightly different color just to give some life into a sort of rocky brick texture on these walls which is a really cool trick and I think it combines well even with the uh, rocky fences to create a kind of more natural stone looking texture which is something that Parkitect doesn't really have for walls but using these kind of pieces I think you can create the same sort of atmosphere and then of course we have this little main street area with the food stalls which are currently running out of supplies, well, whatever. Um, something I forgot to mention actually, um, <laughs> although I actually mentioned it in an earlier recording of the time-lapse commentary which I threw away, but um, I actually added a maypole instead of the fountain which you could see me build in the time-lapse because I think this is thematically a more fitting addition given that this park would be somewhere in Bavaria or Tyrol or an area like this adding an iconic maypole would probably just be a cool addition usually in real life these things are some sort of pine tree with only the top still green and then a ring um, of some kind of shrubbery I'm not entirely sure what it is but due to the fact that we don't have round hedges this wheel is just kind of what I came up with. So it's a bit of a funky looking maple, but it's uh, something that I feel still carries the theme of this map. And finally, let's take a quick look at the floorless coaster here, where I do think that the castle is easily the main weenie and the best part about this map. Uh, so this layout actually kind of has a pre-lift section as well which is not too spectacular, but it's always fun to be able to make use of the terrain to do things like this. And it actually has a very short lift hill compared to the total length of the layout. 
just because of the fact that the station is so high and we can use all of the energy, uh, all of the potential energy that we store here uh, up until it gets to the station. Now that roll through the station is kind of slow, but I think it also sort of fits given the fact that it's going through the station and it interacts with the scenery in such a way. And we have some other inversions, twists, and a little airtime hill. And then we're back into the station, or more or less the general area of the station, because I decided to add a mid-course break run here. Now, <laughs> this is kind of annoying, I guess, for the people who are sitting in the front, because, well, as you can see, as it's stuck on the mid-course, or uh, rather the, the final break run, it's, uh, it's exposed in the front, just because I thought it just looks better like this. I didn't want to extend the roof to the same length as the tower. So <laughs> this is what I ended up doing. This is totally form over function. So I'm sure any modernist architect is going to hate me for this, but whatever. I don't really mind. I know that on some real life coasters, you do have cases like this as well. So for instance, I remember riding uh, Helix once, and actually I say once, but I've written it a bunch of times. But I've written it in rain once, and I believe it is when you're at the back and you're at the final break run that the entire train is underneath the roof, but you're just outside of it. Um, <laughs> sometimes it just happens that for whatever reason, the architecture of the mid-course break run or of the final break run usually doesn't quite match up to where the trains are going to stand. So it's a bit annoying, but I wouldn't say it's entirely unrealistic. But yeah, that is basically it for this map. As you can see, it's really very simple. Just three coasters, a bunch of flat rides, some buildings, and that's just about it. So all in all, I didn't actually add that much to this scenario, but I'm really happy with the coasters that I managed to add, especially the Florida's coaster. Uh, the interaction that it has with the castle, I think, is just really cool. It is more of an omnidirectional building, actually, that I made it seem for a second there. Um, really trying to make it look cool from every angle. Although, I have to see, well, I, I have to say, while well, some angles give you a better view of the Zero G roll going through the station, this angle is still my favorite. <laughs> That's definitely the one that this is sort of mainly built from. Um, and then I kind of want to show off the most as well. Uh, but then when it comes to an area like the main street, for instance, this building kind of works very well from the front as well. Especially when I was building the maypole here, I was trying to check how the, the main street area would look from the front. I know it's a bit ridiculous to call this place a main street, but Given the limited space in this scenario, I think this is about as Main Street-ish as I think I could get it. Before I leave this, I'm really gonna have to get an extra uh, janitor because this is, this is just ridiculous. I also didn't put a cover over the carousel for once, which is kind of unusual, I guess, but I think it works out like this. And for a while, I was considering maybe expanding the park into this direction. But I also have to say, I can't buy any more land and this is just a really awkward sort of valley where I couldn't really come up with anything useful to add. So I'm leaving it like this, which I think is fair enough. So let's save the park at this point. Uh, <laughs> you might notice that I've already started on the next scenario. Don't pay too much attention to it. We'll keep it a secret which scenario the next one's going to be. Um, and actually, I'm very curious to see what the trophy for this scenario is going to look like, because I have no idea. So it's the little mining shack, that makes sense. And then the next scenario, I'm not sure if I'm going to get a new one. Yeah, okay, so we are. That looks like it's Robo Park. Am I right? Yeah, there we go. Oh, that's going to be fun. 600 guests, no loan debts, overall park rating, etc. It's actually not too difficult of a park, but it's definitely one that lets you very free to go in a sci-fi theme. But next time it's going to be Disaster Peaks, as you might have already seen. I'm gonna try and fix up this complete mess of a park, uh, which I'm very curious to see how that's gonna go, because I actually haven't tested this one much personally. So 
it might just become uh, <laughs> it might just turn into some sort of disaster in terms of me actually trying to manage it oh well we'll see hopefully it's gonna be fine anyway thanks for watching guys and i hope to see you in the next one